welcome to Novel Conversations. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and today I'll be having a conversation about the novel 1984 by George Orwell. Joining me in conversation are our Novel Conversations readers, Joan and Patrick Andrews. Joan, Patrick, hello. Hello, Frank. Hello, Frank. Double plus good to see you today. <laughs> Double plus good to see you as well and to get started on our conversation. Joan, Patrick, our novel today, 1984 is a dystopian novel set in London, a grim city in the totalitarian state of Oceania, where Big Brother is always watching you and the thought police can practically read your mind. Our main character, Winston Smith, is a man in grave danger for the simple reason that his memory still functions. Drawn into a forbidden love affair, Winston finds the courage to join a secret revolutionary organization called the Brotherhood. Together with his beloved Julia, he hazards his life in a deadly match against the powers that be. So, Joan, Patrick, does that summary remind you of the book you read when you were in high school? Well, it would have, Frank, had I read it in high school. How did you avoid reading this in high school? Well, I didn't avoid it. It just wasn't assigned in 1983. Well, aren't you glad I assigned it now and made it unavoidable? (laughs) Yes, I am, Frank. And, Joan, apparently I assigned it to you as well. Apparently it's not assigned as widely as we thought. With those brief comments and introductions, let's talk about the book. Patrick, how does our book start? The book opens like this. It was a bright, cold day in April. And the clocks were striking 13. Apparently in this world, they're using military time? Correct. So it's 1 o'clock in the afternoon. What's happening on this bright, cold day in April at 1 o'clock? Well, our hero, Winston Smith, is slipping out of work, going home for a quick lunch. But as he walks up every flight to his apartment, he's not quite alone, is he? No, there's a face watching him at every landing. Patrick, what is that face? That is Big Brother. Big Brother is watching him. The face of a man of about 45 with a heavy black mustache and ruggedly handsome features. And then when he gets into his apartment, there's another thing coming at you. It's the noise of the telescreen. Well, what's so odd about that? My TV's always on. (laughs) Well, unlike a television, the screen watches Winston. That's right. It can hear and it can see. You could turn the volume down, but you could never turn it off. In fact, the poster that we mentioned is captioned, Big Brother is watching you. Because he knows the telescreen is watching him. And not just his actions, but also the expression on his face. And we know that he's come home at lunchtime, but he didn't come home for lunch. Well, Patrick, he doesn't have anything to eat, but he has a little something to drink. Mm -hmm. Victory gin? A colorless liquid that gave off a sickly, oily smell. He pours out nearly a teacupful, nerved himself, and gulped it down like a dose of medicine. (laughs) In swallowing it, one had the sensation of being hit on the back of the head with a rubber club. But that rubber club feeling doesn't last forever, does it, Patrick? No, the burning in his belly died down, and the world began to look a little more cheerful. But Joan, Patrick, Winston Smith didn't come home and miss his lunch just so he could have a quick shot of terrible gin and a half a cigarette. What is he home for? He came home... To do something quietly rebellious. But how can he do that when he knows the telescreen is watching his every move? Because in Winston's apartment, there is a little corner of the room where the telescreen can't see him. He's got a little alcove or something. Correct. What is this quiet act of rebellion that he wants to perform unseen? The thing that he was about to do was to open a diary. My goodness, what does he write? April 4th, 1984. Well, that does sound subversive. Oh, but it is. After he put pen to paper, he realizes that he's told it's 1984, but he doesn't really know. In this world now, nobody really knows what the date is. But suddenly he realized now that he's worked up the courage, he doesn't know what to write. So He gives a matter-of-fact account of how he spent the previous evening. How did he spend his night? He went to the movies. An enjoyable musical, I hope. Well, to this audience, it was an enjoyable war film. Right. The audience was much amused by the scenes of survivors being machine gunned in the water. After writing this brief description of the movie he had seen last night, Winston stops writing again. He realizes that while he'd been writing about the movie, a totally different memory had clarified itself in his mind. This memory was from something that occurred at work this morning while they were in preparation for something called the Two Minutes Hate. Right. While they were setting up the room, two people walked into the room. Well, one was a girl. Who was she? It was a bold-looking girl of about 27 with thick, dark hair, a freckled face, and swift athletic movements. Everything about her screamed party to him, and party to him meant the swallowers of slogans, the amateur spies, and the nosers out of unorthodoxy. In other words, she was terrifying to Winston. She seemed so representative of the party, she might even be part of the dreaded thought police. Winston disliked her from the very moment of seeing her. And the other person that he recognized but didn't know 
was a man named O'Brien, and he's a member of the Inner Party. He's described as a large, burly man with a thick neck and a coarse, humorous, brutal face. But there's something about him. Right, as George Orwell says, in spite of his formidable appearance, he had a certain charm of manner. So O'Brien, the actual Inner Party member, doesn't fill Winston with fear. Right, as Orwell immediately describes, in the next moment a hideous, grinding screech, as of some monstrous machine running without oil, burst from the big telescreen at the end of the room. It was a noise that set one's teeth on edge and bristled the hair at the back of one's neck. The hate had started. And Patrick, it starts with? As usual, the face of Emmanuel Goldstein. And Emmanuel Goldstein is? He had once been one of the leading figures in the party, almost on a level with Big Brother himself. And then he engaged in counter-revolutionary activities. A portion of every two minutes' hate consisted of Goldstein delivering his usual venomous attack upon the doctrines of the party. He was advocating for freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of thought. And Patrick, we're actually given the name of the organization which Emmanuel Goldstein is presumed to control. The Brotherhood. An underground network of conspirators dedicated to the overthrow of the state. But Patrick, the thing that the party feared the most about Goldstein appears to be his book. There were whispered stories of a terrible book, a compendium of all the heresies of which Goldstein was the author and which circulated clandestinely. Without a title. It was just called The Book. But Patrick, Joan, let's be clear. At this point during the two minutes hate, the audience isn't listening to Goldstein. They're barely watching the video. They've reached frenzy, and all they're doing is shouting, screaming, literally throwing things at the screen. And that includes Winston, who easily gets caught up in the rush, and he's screaming, swine, swine, even though we learn it's the party that he's hating on, not this Goldstein. Right. In fact, Winston tells us himself the horrible thing about the two minutes hate was not that one was obliged to act a part, but that it was impossible to avoid joining in. Which is very convenient for Winston because he can get caught up and do what he has to do and protect what he's thinking in his mind. Without the thought police knowing. Right. But Joan, Winston's feelings of hatred continue. Now his hatred turns to a third person, this young girl. Yes, the young and pretty and sexless girl. She is all about party. She will never be the girl for Winston, or so he thinks, and he hates her for it. And we're told that the hate rose to its climax. And the voice of Goldstein had become an actual sheep's bleat. And for an instant, the face changed into that of an actual sheep. And then the sheep face melted into the figure of a Eurasian soldier who seemed to be advancing, huge and terrible. And the people actually flinching in the front rows. And then comes relief. Relief appears on the screen in the visage of... Big Brother. Just the sight of him mysteriously calms the audience. And then Big Brother fades away. And the three slogans of the party fill the screen. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. And ignorance is strength. Yep. And then the whole room is chanting, Big Brother, Big Brother. And then for Winston, he has an extraordinary moment. The moment that he felt he had a rush home to write about. A flash of the eye. A flash of whose eye? Big Brother's? No, O'Brien's. Momentarily, he caught O'Brien's eye. And he knew. He knew immediately that O'Brien was thinking the same thing as himself. And that was the incident that encouraged Winston to go home and start this little rebellion. His fate was sealed. He had committed thought crime. He continues in his hurried, untidy scrawl. They'll shoot me. I don't care. They'll shoot me in the back of the neck. I don't care. Down with Big Brother. This feeling of inevitability. Not will I be caught, but I will be caught. And then... There was a knocking at the door. Well, that was quick. (laughs) That's what he thought. Joan, the thought police? No, it's the neighbor, Mrs. Parsons. Is she there to arrest him? No, Frank. She has a stop drain she's hoping that Winston can help her with. She's the wife of actually a fellow employee in the ministry. Yes, Mr. Parson. This guy is a true believer. And has the uniforms to prove it. (laughs) Right. And so do his children. Yes, his children are members of the spies. That's a youth group. Right. Like the Boy Scouts. Yeah, if the Boy Scouts' aim is to detect any unorthodoxy of your parents and have them reported and vaporized. Right. With kids' loyalty turned to the state, it's normal now for parents over 30 to be afraid of their own children. Yes, and... Mrs. Parsons surely is. In fact, they're playing at that as Winston walks in, yelling at him, you're a traitor, you're a thought criminal. (laughs) But as a good neighbor, Winston helps Mrs. Parsons out and clears her drain. Yeah. As he's making his way back to his door, 
one of the kids shoots in the back of the neck with a slingshot. It's always in the back. (laughs) After this digression with Mrs. Parsons, Winston Smith tries to get back to writing in his diary, and he's interrupted again, this time by the telescreen. News flash reporting a great victory from the Malabar Front against the Eurasian forces. Which Winston immediately knows means bad news for him. Bad news for everybody. And sure enough, after the great victory is recounted, It's announced that the chocolate ration is going to be reduced from 30 grams to 20 grams. And Joan, after the telescreen, he's interrupted for a third time, this time by sounds from outside the window. Bombs? Yes, it seems to be normal that 20 or 30 bombs a week fall somewhere in London. And it sort of inspires him, and suddenly he writes. To the future or to the past, to a time when thought is free, when men are different from one another and do not live alone, to a time when truth exists and what is done cannot be undone. From the age of uniformity, from the age of solitude, from the age of big brother, from the age of doublethink. Greetings. And he stops and realizes this is thought crime. So he writes, thought crime does not entail death. Thought crime is death. And then Orwell tells us, now that he had recognized himself as a dead man, it became important to stay alive as long as possible. Then off to work at Mini True. So true. Joan Patrick, our next chapter begins with Winston dreaming of his mother. Right. His parents are no longer alive. Well, he doesn't know what happened to his parents. Right. He believes that they must have been swallowed up in the first great purge of the 50s. But the impression he takes away from this dream is that his mother and sister had been sacrificed or sacrificed themselves for him so he could remain alive. It seems this is a recent thought of Winston's. He says that the thing that now suddenly struck him was that his mother's death nearly 30 years ago had been tragic and sorrowful in a way that was no longer possible. Right, this concept of love between a mother and a child is a distant memory to Winston. But Winston's not only dreaming about his mother, he thinks about a young woman. Right, it's a dream where he's in the place he calls the golden country. It's a beautiful pasture, the sun is shining brightly, and that beautiful, dark-haired girl, of which he's so afraid of in real life, coming at him in a very friendly manner. Very friendly. <laughs> yes, he's not afraid of her at all in this dream. And then he wakes up from this dream with the word Shakespeare on his lips. And he has to wake up from this dream because the telescreen is screeching. It's time for the physical jerks. Yes, the morning exercise routine. And Joan, while he's doing his exercises, that allows him to daydream. This time, he's not dreaming. He's remembering or... Trying to remember. Trying to remember an air raid when he was young and his father hurriedly taking him down some steps with his mother and sister following behind, and they end up down in a tube station with lots and lots of other people waiting out the raid. For Winston, this memory represents the beginning of the wars. Right, in the fact that he can't remember a time now when they were not at war. Right. Well, at war with whom? Well, that's the question. <laughs> he knows now that in 1984, assuming it is 1984, Oceania is at war with Eurasia and in alliance with East Asia. But knows... And then another time in the past, they've been at war with East Asia, an alliance with Eurasia, or he thinks he knows that. Patrick, who are these other countries, these other enemies that Winston is describing? Well, it seems, Frank, that the entire world has been reduced to three political powers, East Asia, Eurasia. And of course, Oceania. And of course, Oceania. And they're all at war or allied with another at various times. And at all times. And at all times. It's really starting to bother Winston that he can remember something different than what the party is telling him. It's beginning to concern him that the party really is controlling the past. Right, Patrick. He's beginning to understand the party's slogan about controlling the past. Right. The slogan is, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. And Winston is starting to realize that's terrifying. But he's quickly pulled out of this daydream by the instructress on the telescreen. Right. Smith screamed the shrewish voice from the telescreen, 6079. Smith, W. Yes, you. Bend lower, please. You can do better than that. You're not trying. <laughs> lower, please. That's better, comrade. So they are really watching as well as listening. Yes, they are. And our next chapter begins with Smith at work. And now we really get a chance to see how the party rewrites the past. Because that's Winston's job. That's what he does. (laughs) Well, he sits in his office and he receives slips of paper through pneumatic tubes. When what's happening today doesn't match with what the party said happened or was going to happen yesterday, 
It's Winston's job to go back into the files and change history. He has to change the prediction that was made in order for it to match up with the reality of today. Correct. Not only that, but the piece of paper that told him what he has to fix has to immediately go into the memory hole to be incinerated. There is no evidence that the past has ever been changed. The memory hole is this little slit at his desk that all the waste paper goes into. So it's a great Orwellian (laughs) term, the memory hole. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Burn the Boats from Evergreen Podcasts. I interview political leaders and influencers, folks like award-winning journalist Soledad O'Brien and conservative columnist Bill Kristol about the choices they confront when failure is not an option. I won't agree with everyone I talk to, but I respect anyone who believes in something enough to risk everything for it. Because history belongs to those willing to burn the boats. Episodes are out every other week wherever you get your podcasts. But Patrick, he doesn't only change the past. Sometimes he's asked to create the past. For example, the Ministry of Plenty's forecast had estimated the output of boots for the quarter at 145 million pairs. The actual output was given as 62 million. Winston, however, was rewriting the forecast, marked the figure down to 57 million, so as to allow for the usual claim that the quota had been overfulfilled. Although... Winston knew most people in Oceana had no boots at all, and that it was very likely no boots had been produced. And by the way, their chocolate ration had never been lessened. They always have the same copious amount of wonderful chocolate. The problem is Winston Smith can't forget the past. That's the itch, like his varicose ulcer that he keeps scratching. That's why he keeps looking for somebody to talk to. There are people he can talk to. We get that scene in the lunchroom where we do meet a couple of his comrades. I'm not sure we can call them friends. Mr. Sim comes to my mind. That's right. Sim is a Newspeak specialist. He's working on the latest edition of the Newspeak Dictionary. Right, the 11th edition it's going to be. And his job is to, in some cases, create words, but in many cases, to destroy words. And Joan, this is where we begin to learn just how Newspeak works. Right. He's talking to Winston about the adjective good. He explains to him that if you have a word like good, you don't need the word bad. All you need is to put un in front of good. Therefore, it's more efficient. So bad is gone. Now, if something isn't as good as they'd like, it's ungood. And if something's much better than they thought it would be, it would be plus good. And there's even a double plus good. (laughs) That must be really good. No, no need for really. Just (laughs) Just double plus. Double plus. So who needs excellent, splendid, wonderful? In fact, Sim says, don't you see that the whole aim of Newspeak is to narrow the range of thought? In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words in which to express it. This was Big Brother's wonderful idea, of course. In fact, for Sim, the proudest moment is when he says, Newspeak is the only language in the world whose vocabulary gets smaller every year. This is no ordinary lunchroom, though. Everyone here knows they're being watched and listened to by the telescreens. Right. Everything they say has to be party approved. And to Winston's amazement, everything they think has to be party approved. How they set their face has to be party approved. Right. And Patrick, Winston Smith has one more somewhat disturbing moment before he leaves the uh, luncheon canteen. That dark-haired girl was sitting at the table next to him. She was looking at him in a sidelong way but with a curious intensity. The instant she caught his eye, she looked away again. And the sweat started out in Winston's backbone. Right. Winston doesn't think she's looking at him because she's attracted to him. Mm -mm. What's his fear? Face crime. So he's worried that he may have betrayed something unconsciously through an expression when he wasn't aware that she was observing him. And our scene shifts again very swiftly. Winston is back to writing in his diary. Another memory. Now we learn Winston Smith has a wife. Well... He thinks he's married. He knows he had been. She hasn't been vaporized, has she? Well, no, we don't think so. Orwell writes, all marriages between party members had to be approved by a committee appointed for that purpose. And the only recognized purpose of marriage was to beget children for the service of the party. Apparently, Winston and his wife had no children. And although the party did not permit divorce, it encouraged separation in cases where there were no children. So Winston hasn't seen his wife in we don't know how long. We learn here that the party teaches from childhood onward that human interaction of any kind. Physical or otherwise. Is at best a necessary evil. 
at worst disgusting. But Joan, in the next chapter, we learn that most of the population of Oceana is not in the party. Right. These proles are 85% of the population of Oceana and growing. That's why Winston writes in his diary, if there is hope, it lies with the proles. In fact, they're the only force he thinks that could destroy the party if they were ever motivated to do so. And the proles are you and I, perfectly normal human beings who have not been indoctrinated into the party. But Patrick, it doesn't seem that the party or Big Brother is afraid of the proles. They don't have telescreens in their houses, do they? That's right. They live seemingly a much freer daily life. According to the party, like animals. Subject to their senses and urges. Essentially, they're slaves. They're just labor for the party. Freedom is slavery. And apparently, all party members accept this about the proles because they've been taught that life in London before the party took over was a miserable affair and the capitalists took advantage of everyone and allowed no one freedom and peace the way the party does. Or so they've been told. In fact, the history book reads, In the old days, before the glorious revolution, London was not the beautiful city that we know today. For Winston, this nagging idea that things had not always been this way is bolstered by an incident he recalls that happened to him about 10 years ago in his job. Winston comes across a picture of three early party leaders who had subsequently been disgraced and tried for treason. During their confessions of their crimes, they all claim to have been on Eurasian soil committing this treason. And Winston comes across this photograph, which shows them at that time at a party meeting in New York. So he feels he's holding now physical evidence of the party's attempt to alter the past. And that somehow if he could expose this picture to somebody somebody or the rest of the party, it would wake everybody up to the fact that It's lies, lies all around them. Joan, I guess it's a good thing Winston kept this photograph. Oh, no. That photograph was only in his hands for a few fleeting seconds because he knew that the telescreens were watching. And so into the memory hole went that picture. You mean the unmemory hole? (laughs) Yes. But it stayed in his own personal memory, which was a problem for him. He writes in his diary, he understands how. In fact, he's part of how. It's his job to change history. But he does not understand why. This was really beginning to wear on Winston. He began to realize that if the party said two and two made five, you'd have to agree. Not only would you have to agree, you might not even remember that two plus two equaled four. So he wrote in his diary, freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two makes four. If that is granted, all else follows. Wow. Joan, our next chapter begins with a bit of rebellion on the part of Winston Smith. He takes a walk. Yes. He skips the night at the community center. Mandatory attendance. Yes. He's drawn to the Proles neighborhood. He doesn't really know why, but it's not party life. Well, he might think he knows why. Remember, he wrote in his diary, if there's hope, it's with the Proles. Speaking of his diary, he finds himself back at this little sort of used goods junk store where he had purchased the diary. And he's recognized by the proprietor there, Mr. Charrington. He actually buys something else at Charrington's, a little glass paperweight. A pretty but useless little thing. But important to him because it's an artifact of? The past. And it's beautiful. Not a lot of beauty in this world. Not in the party's world. And Mr. Charrington mentions that he has some things in an upstairs room that Winston may be interested in. As it turns out, though, Winston's not that interested in the things in the room. He actually is interested in the room itself. It's a bedroom, Mr. Charrington says, where he used to live with his wife until she died. With a fireplace and a chair and a coffee pot and no telescreen. Winston thinks this could be a sanctuary for me. Well, yes, and the thought is erased from his mind when he steps out the door and the dark-haired girl is there on the sidewalk. See, so she is following him. Now he's pretty sure, and he's terrified. He's so terrified that he briefly contemplates smashing her skull with a cobblestone. But then he realizes she was young and strong and would defend herself. So he did what he could do. He went home and waited for the knock on the door. Because they always come for you at night. But the knock never came. And it's not until four days later that he sees the girl again. She's walking towards him down the corridor at work, and she has her arm in a sling. As she approaches him, she stumbles and falls at his feet. Almost instinctively, he stops to help her up, and in the process, she slips a piece of paper into his hand. 
Uh-oh. So he can't do anything with that piece of paper but walk on until he can figure out a time to open it. He assumed that this is thought police. It could be a threat. It could be a summons. It could be an order to commit suicide, some sort of trap. He doesn't know what it could be. But there's even a wilder possibility. The girl could have given him a note from the Brotherhood. But then he thinks that's, of course, absurd. How's he going to manage to read this paper without being seen by these omnipresent telescreens? Very carefully. He sort of hides it in plain sight on his desk among all the other scraps of paper. And then ignores it for eight long, agonizing minutes. Stop leaving me in suspense. (laughs) He reads the note. What does this note say? I love you. Wow. For the rest of the morning, it was very difficult to work. I can imagine. He was stunned. (laughs) Yes. Now what? He has no idea. Right. I mean, how could he contact her without arousing some suspicion? It's not like you can send her a letter. He doesn't even know her name. He doesn't know where she lives. Every piece of writing is censored by the party. There's only really one place where he can come into contact with her. Well, (laughs) that he can have any sort of communication with her. And that would be the luncheon canteen. Correct. Correct. He's got to figure out a way to sit next to her and then somehow figure out a way to communicate with her. And it takes quite a few days, but finally it happens. He manages to sit at her table. Their eyes never meet, their faces never change, but a little bit of information is conveyed. They'll meet at Victory Square at 1900 hours. And thus begins a clandestine affair between Winston and... Julia. Julia. She's done this before. Yes, Julia is a member of the party in good standing... Goes to all the right marches. She volunteers. Three nights a week at the Junior Anti-Sex League. Yes. She always looks cheerful. She never shirks anything. And Julia hates the party. But Joan, as we learn, she doesn't hate the party the way Winston hates the party. Julia was a young girl who loved life or wanted to love life. And she thought it was ridiculous how much the party took the joy out of life. That's right. Her opposition isn't political or ideological. She says, life as she saw it was quite simple. You wanted a good time. They, meaning the party, wanted to stop you from having it. You broke the rules as best you could. And Joan, Patrick, for the next few chapters of our book, this love affair continues. But they do have obstacles to face. The biggest one being, where do they meet? For a while, they follow Julia's lead in finding a bunch of hidden places around London But then Winston remembers Mr. Charrington in the room above his shop. That's right. Maybe now it really can be his sanctuary. And also, both of them were well aware that they were dead already. Oh, but in that case, you might as well get as much enjoyment as you can for as long as you can. Yep. And so they start coming to this room a little bit more often, a little bit more regularly. In fact, Julia tries to make it their own little place. She cleans it. She brings little foodstuffs that she's picked up at the black market. They have real coffee. They even have real chocolate. But they also have rats. Winston particularly hates the rats. Oh, Winston doesn't want to hear about the rats. Of all horrors in the world, a rat, he says. He doesn't like them. No, he doesn't. But throughout this love affair, Winston is happy, but he knows he still hasn't found someone he can talk to. That's right. She only questioned the teachings of the party when they in some way touched upon her own life. She's not curious about the past, the history of the party, and these are things that Winston wants to talk to her about. Right. Winston eventually says to her, you're only a rebel from the waist downwards. She took it as a compliment. Clearly, Winston is going to have to get that satisfaction from someone else. And it turns out in the next chapter... That someone else may in fact be O'Brien. Winston bumps into O'Brien in the corridor at work, and O'Brien, the senior inner party member, mentions that he had read some of Winston's work and thought it was very good. Right, but he also mentioned that he had recently used two obsolete words, but that he wouldn't have known they were obsolete because it's in the newest edition of the Newspeak Dictionary. An edition that has not yet been released. Correct. But O'Brien would have had access to it as an inner party member. And O'Brien, right in front of the telescreen, invites Winston to come to his home to see this new edition. That's right. He writes down his address, says, I'm usually at home in the evenings. If not, my servant will give you the dictionary. But in the next chapter, he's dreaming of his mother again. We get a little more of the story of when his mother disappeared. And clearly his younger sister was starving to death. Winston remembers an incident with some chocolate in the house. Of course, there wasn't much. And the mother gave some to his little sister and to Winston. But Winston wanted them both and he took them both. And he ran away with his mother screaming, come back, come back. Winston did not. When he finally came back, the mother and the sister were gone. And he has some sense 
of guilt, as if he had done something to hurt his mother and his sister. And that makes him realize the only place he ever sees that kind of connection between two people are among the proles. Somehow he gets it. The proles are human. The party members are becoming unhuman. But this doesn't interest Julia at all. Julia is a practical girl. And that leads to an interesting conversation they have about what might happen to them when they are discovered. Well, they know they're going to be tortured, and they're going to confess terrible things against the party. But that's not really what concerns them. Well, what does concern them? They say the one thing that matters is that we shouldn't betray one another. Only feelings matter. If they could make me stop loving you, that would be the real betrayal. And then she said, they can't do that. It's the one thing they can't do. They can make you say anything, anything, but they can't make you believe it. They can't get inside you. And with this discussion, Winston feels that this relationship is solid. He now decides to pursue the relationship with O'Brien and finally go to visit him. He does. And actually, Julia comes along too. That's right. And as an inner party member, O'Brien has a pretty nice thing going. He's got a great little apartment. He even has servants. And wine. And wine. And elevators that work. And real cigarettes. But Patrick, the most amazing thing about O'Brien is that he can turn his telescreen off. Julia and Winston had no idea that was even possible. But even then, O'Brien tells them it can only be off for about a half hour or so. Why did O'Brien feel it necessary to turn off the telescreen? Well, as it turns out, he is a member of the Brotherhood. So the Brotherhood does exist. And Goldstein exists. And he's alive. Really? And he's a good man. Really? In fact, O'Brien begins to enroll them in the Brotherhood. With a series of questions. He asks them if they're prepared to give up their lives, to commit murder, acts of sabotage, to cause the deaths of hundreds of innocent people, corrupt minds of children. And to every question, Winston and Julia both say, yes. Yes. But there is one question to which they respond, no. O'Brien asks, you are prepared, the two of you, to separate and never see one another again? O'Brien says, you did well to tell me. It is necessary for us to know everything. What commitment does the Brotherhood make to Winston and Julia? Well, according to O'Brien, they will get no comradeship and no encouragement. When finally you are caught, he tells them, you will get no help. We never help our members. You will work for a while, you will be caught, you will confess, and then you will die. There is no possibility that any perceptible change will happen within our own lifetime. He confirms what Winston and Julia had already known. We are the dead. He also tells him, though, that he's going to get the book. The The book? book. You mean Emmanuel Goldstein's book? That's the one. But O'Brien wants to know if Winston has a place to hide the book. Oh, yeah, they tell him all about the room over Mr. Charrington's shop. And O'Brien approves. I can't wait to read this book. Well, you're going to have to wait because hate week is on the way. A whole week of hate? A whole week of hate. Which is going to entail lots of work, overtime work. And really, hate week is just an extension of two minutes hate. Railing against the enemy. Which has become East Asia now, don't you know? I guess I forgot. Hmm. And actually, it's on the last day of Hate Week celebration, the book gets passed to Winston. And he can't wait to get back to his room to read this book. He can. And read it with Julia. Or so he tries. So Patrick, Joan, for the next few chapters of our book, we're given a lot of the text of the Goldstein book. Winston reads it to Julia. She promptly falls asleep. But he continues to read. Correct. What's in this book? Well, Goldstein lays out how the party came to be and essentially what the party's aims are. In particular, he breaks down the party slogans, ignorance is strength, war is peace, freedom is slavery. And the party's goal really is to remain in power. Yes, he explains how previous attempts at totalitarian societies in the 20th century, Russian communists, Nazi Germany, they claimed be trying to do something to help the people. But Goldstein explained the party realized a fatal flaw of that explanation. Which was? To give the people hope of a better life. Because then they expected the better life. And when you couldn't deliver it, they would then rebel and start a new order. Right. Now, Big Brother has recognized that cycle. So he's not going to raise up the low. And he's not going to change the people in the middle. He's just going to maintain the power of the high. And if the party is always at war, then the people must always do what they can and endure any sort of deprivation to support that party. That's why the party keeps these wars going or tells the people that these wars are going on indefinitely. By never-ending war, peace is maintained within that society. Therefore, war is Peace. That's right. Winston Smith is beginning to conclude that there might not actually be wars against East Asia and Eurasia. 
This might just all be a fiction of Big Brother in order to keep the people striving to protect the party. Yes, and Julia thought that all along. And that's also why it's important for the party to be able to control the past. If people have memories of a better time, they're going to want to strive to recapture that. And that's why they want no love between the people. Your only loyalty can be to the party. Not to a spouse, a child, a sibling. Correct. And Patrick Joan, let's be clear. Winston knew this, but this codifies it for him. And with that confirmation, it allows him to finally relax. And he drifts off into one of the best sleeps he's ever had. Right. He felt safe. He felt like all that he knew was right. It wasn't just the insane ramblings of his own mind. So he went to sleep with hope. But it only lasted one night. But it wasn't a knock on the door. But an iron voice, you are the dead. An iron voice? From the telescreen. I didn't think there was a telescreen in this room. Well, there was, Frank, and it was concealed behind a picture on the wall. Oh, that sneaky big brother. Oh, but it's worse than that. Worse? Yes. Moments later, the man whose voice it was on the screen walked into the room. It was Mr. Charrington. Charrington? The kindly old junk shop man who had let Winston and Julia use his room all this time. So Charrington is the inner party? Charrington is a member of the Thought Police. Even worse. Yeah. So Charrington arrests Winston and Julia? Well, Charrington and about 100 jackbooted thugs that come in and take them away. Where are they taken? Well, we never know where Julia is taken, but... Winston seems to awake in what he presumes is the Ministry of Love. Mini love. Yeah, how about no love? It is a high ceiling, windowless cell. He has no idea what time it is. He has no idea what day it is. The only thing he's aware of is his hunger. He's in an empty, tiled room with only a narrow bench along the walls on which to sit. And, of course, there were four telescreens, one on each wall. It turns out this is a holding cell of sorts. Prisoners come in, prisoners go out, but Winston stays. And the stream of prisoners amazes Winston. He knows many of them, including Mr. Parsons. Mr. Parsons? His neighbor? Yes, the zealous party member. What's he in for? Apparently he muttered in his sleep, down with Big Brother, and the children overheard it. His seven-year-old daughter turned him in. That's right, and with a pride, he says she listened at the keyhole. Pretty smart for a nipper of seven, eh? I don't bear her any grudge for it. In fact, I'm proud of her. It shows I brought her up in the right spirit anyway. (laughs) Well, that might be a mitigating factor for the judge. And then the door opens again. O'Brien. Winston starts to his feet, shocked. He says, they've got you too? They got me a long time ago, said O'Brien, with a mild, almost regretful irony. And then he stepped aside. From behind him, there emerged a broad-chested guard with a long black truncheon in his hand. You knew this, Winston, said O'Brien. Don't deceive yourself. You did know it. You've always known it. And then the misery began. And with that first blow on the elbow, the nightmare had started. And this nightmare, directed by O'Brien, continues for at least three or four chapters in our book. He's tortured. They allow him to recover a little bit. They torture him again. They allow him to recover. And all Winston wants to know, tell me what you want me to say, and I'll say it. He confesses to assassinating party members, to embezzling public funds, selling military secrets, sabotage of every kind. But in the end, these confessions don't satisfy O'Brien. This is not what O'Brien and the party wants to hear. No, O'Brien wants more. O'Brien holds up four fingers in front of Winston's face and says, how many fingers? And Winston says four. And that's not right. O'Brien asks again, how many fingers? Four fingers. No, it's five fingers. Winston says one more time, no, it's four fingers. O'Brien says, no, it's five fingers. Finally, Winston catches on. He says, I see five fingers. But that's still not the answer O'Brien wants. Because he knows that Winston's just giving him the answers that he wants. He doesn't believe it. O'Brien actually says, we are not content with negative obedience. When finally you surrender to us, it must be of your own free will. Right. They've come to the limits of what pain can do to people. You can make people say anything because they're afraid of the pain. But they want people to believe what they're saying. Right. He goes on to say, we do not destroy the heretic because he resists us. We convert him. We capture his inner mind. We reshape him. We make the brain perfect before we blow it out. The party doesn't want your body. The party wants your mind. And O'Brien essentially acknowledges that by saying, we have cut the links between child and parent, between man and man, between man and woman. No one dares trust a wife or a child or a friend any longer. Right. See Parsons. He finishes. He says, if you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face 
forever. There it is. He says, you're beginning, I can see, to realize what the world will be like. But in the end, you will do more than understand it. You will accept it. Yeah, but Patrick, that's a huge leap between understanding and accepting. How are they going to get him to accept this? Well, that acceptance, Frank, will be found in Room 101. Uh, Room 101 is just too much to bear. That's right. Joe and Patrick, Room 101 is not a scary room. Oh, yes, it is. Because in Room 101 is my fear. Your Room 101 would be your fear. Uh-huh. And for Winston, we know his fear. Rats. It's a terrible scene. For Winston, Room 101 is a place where they've rigged up sort of a cage that sort of locks onto the front of Winston's face. And these starving carnivorous rats will be released to feed on his face. Mm. That is what is unendurable for Winston. O'Brien says, I've pressed the first lever. When I press this other lever, the door of the cage will slide up. These starving brutes will shoot out of it like bullets. Have you ever seen a rat leap through the air? They will leap onto your face and bore straight into it. Stop. Sometimes they attack the eyes first. This is where Winston digs down to what he knows he's held on to. Julia. Yes, he has. Right. He suddenly understood that in the whole world, there was just one person to whom he could transfer his punishment. One body that he could thrust between himself and the rats. And he was shouting frantically over and over, do it to Julia, do it to Julia, not me, Julia, not me. And with that, Winston heard another metallic click and knew that the cage door had clicked shut and not open. And the party has their acceptance from Winston Smith. Mm. And Joan Patrick, with acceptance, Winston gains his freedom. You can call it that. But it was all right, Frank. The struggle was finished. He had won the victory over himself. He loved Big Brother. And it's with those thoughts of Winston Smith that our novel, 1984, comes to an end. I want to thank you both for coming in and having this conversation with me. Thanks. You're welcome, Frank. Double good to talk about it, Frank. Thank you again. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. Novel Conversations is a production of Evergreen Podcasts. For more information about upcoming Novel Conversations, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Or go to our website at evergreenpodcast.com. And if you like the podcast, don't forget to leave us a review. It really helps. Novel Conversations is produced by Julie Fink, and our audio engineer is Sean Rule Hoffman. A special thanks to our executive producer, Joan Andrews. And I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Until next time, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Burn the Boats from Evergreen Podcasts. I interview political leaders and influencers, folks like award-winning journalist Soledad O'Brien and conservative columnist Bill Kristol about the choices they confront when failure is not an option. I won't agree with everyone I talk to, but I respect anyone who believes in something enough to risk everything for it. Because history belongs to those willing to burn the boats. Episodes are out every other week wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.